This video shows how to perform a mini thoracotomy mitral valve maze procedure. This is a 66-year-old woman with mitral valve prolapse who presented with heart failure. The patients are positioned with the right chest elevated 45 degrees and the hips flat. A bronchial blocker is used to allow for deflation of the right lung. The patient's prepped and draped and a right subingual incision is made and the femoral artery and vein are exposed. A right mini thoracotomy is, incision is then made in the submammary crease and tunneled up to the fourth intercostal space. The chest is entered through the fourth intercostal space and a soft tissue retractor is used. Care is uh, taken not to do any rib spreading in order to minimize postoperative pain. Pericardial stay sutures are placed in the pericardium and brought out through the lateral chest wall in order to expose the right atrium and intraatrial septum. Dissection of the pericardium is performed up to the ascending aorta and then down to the diaphragm. A port is placed usually in the sixth intercostal space and a camera is used to improve visualization during the case. We usually use a five millimeter 30 degree scope. The intraatrial septum is then dissected as shown here in order to mobilize the groove and allow for adequate pulmonary vein isolation. The space between the right superior pulmonary vein and the right pulmonary artery is then dissected down into the posterior pericardium. As you can see, the pericardium is entered and that space is fully developed. A clamp is then used to place an umbilical tape around the right pulmonary veins. The dissection is then carried out into the transverse sinus under the superior vena cava as shown here. And that allows visualization of the left atrial appendage and you can see that underneath the aorta in that shot. The clamp is then passed around the right pulmonary veins and an umbilical tape is used to surround the right pulmonary veins. This allows for a much safer passage of the bipolar radio frequency clamp, which is used to isolate the right veins. Care is taken when you use this clamp to get as large of cuff as possible of the surrounding left atrium. The ablation is actually performed on this cuff of left atrium and not on the veins themselves. Usually uh, three ablations are performed and you can see the ablation lines there. Testing is then um, performed in order to confirm exit block from both the superior and inferior right pulmonary vein. A purse string suture is then placed in the right atrium just above the intraatrial septum and midway between the superior and inferior vena cava. A 4-0 proline is used for this purse string. The bipolar clamp is then used to perform an ablation as shown here down onto the inferior vena cava with one jaw of the clamp inside and one jaw outside the right atrium. For every um, ablation line created, usually we perform two to three uh, clamps of the uh, bipolar device. And there you can see the lines extending down onto the inferior vena cava. The clamp is then passed through the same purse string suture and placed superiorly up along the lateral aspect of the superior vena cava. Again, the clamp is fired two or three times in order to ensure adequate transmurality. That creates a line of block from the superior to the inferior vena cava, as shown in the video. The clamp again is placed through the same purse string suture and now used to create an ablation line across the right atrial free wall towards the atrioventricular groove approximately at the free margin of the heart. 
The clamp should be placed up to but not on to the AV groove fat pad to avoid any injury to the right coronary artery. The end of the ablation line is often marked with methylene blue. A second purse string suture is then placed at the superior aspect of this final ablation line. The placement of this purse string suture can be facilitated by leaving some volume in on the heart lung machine as shown here. Once this purse string suture is placed, an 11 blade is used to, perform, to make a puncture wound. This is dilated with a tonsil clamp and a linear cryoprobe is then used to create an endocardial cryoblation down to the tricuspid valve annulus. The linear cryoprobe is three centimeters long and you can see the ice ball on the video indica indicating adequate cryoblation. All cryoblations uh, during a maze procedure are performed at minus 60 degrees centigrade for three minutes. And in this case, a nitrous oxide device is used. A third and final purse string suture is placed at the base of the right atrial appendage. Again, a puncture wound is made with an 11 blade. This is dilated with a tonsil clamp and the bipolar clamp is used to create another ablation line across the right atrial free wall and down toward the superior vena cava. Care is taken to leave at least two centimeters between this ablation line and the ablation line that was performed up to the superior vena cava. This ablation line is also brought more on the aortic side of the appendage to avoid any injury to the sinoatrial node. Through the purse string suture, the linear cryoprobe is then used to create a second endocardial cryoblation down to the tricuspid annulus at approximately the 10 o'clock position. This, completes the right, this completed the right atrial maze lesion set. A purse string suture is then placed in the ascending aorta, and a cannula is then placed into the aorta to allow for the administration of cardioplegia and for aortic root venting. A atrial lift system is then positioned via a stab wound along the right anterior chest wall and a transthoracic cross clamp which you can see has been previously positioned via a stab wound in the lateral chest wall. The aorta is then cross clamped and cold blood cardioplegia is administered into the aortic root. The left atrium was the left atrium is then opened and the left atriotomy is expanded in, that, in order to allow for placement of the atrial retractor. This, systems allows, this system allows for excellent exposure of the posterior left atrium and the mitral valve as shown by the video camera. The bipolar clamp is then used to create an ablation line from the inferior aspect of this left atriotomy down toward the left inferior pulmonary vein. Again, the distal aspect of this ablation line is marked with methylene blue. The clamp is fired two or three times again for each ablation line. A second ablation line is then taken from the superior aspect of the left atriotomy through the transverse sinus and down toward the mouth of the left superior pulmonary vein. This ablation line goes over the roof of the atrium. A final ablation line is created from the inferior aspect of the left, left atriotomy down toward the mitral valve annulus. And again, this is marked with methylene blue.
This last ablation line is connected to the mitral valve annulus by performing an endocardial cryoablation with a T-shaped cryoprobe. Again, the cryoablation is performed for three minutes at minus 60 degrees centigrade. In order to complete the left atrial isthmus line, a second epicardial cryoablation is performed over the coronary sinus with a linear cryoprobe. These two cryoablations, both endocardial and epicardial, should be lined up with each other. In order to complete the isolation of the posterior left atrium, the two connecting lines to both the inferior and superior pulmonary vein are connected behind the left pulmonary veins and up the lateral ridge by performing two or three endocardial cryoablations with a T-shaped cryoprobe. This effect effectively isolates all four pulmonary veins and the entire posterior left atrium. And you can see the final endocardial cryoablation connecting to the um, bipolar ablation line that was performed superiorly with the clamp. If there's any question, we often perform an epicardial cryoablation with a linear cryoprobe in order to ensure that the line's connected. At the end of the case, the atrial appendages over sewn is shown here in two layers using a running 4O proline suture. The mitral valve repair is then performed. This patient recovered without complications.